Good morning, everybody. We might make a start, thanks. Just saying, what a fantastic turnout. Uh, we thought we might have to get a bit of a mosh pit um, going down here to, to accommodate everybody. Uh, my name is Les Hodgson. I'm standing in for Andrew Spina, who sends his apologies. He couldn't make it uh, this morning, um, but he does send his best wishes for this event. Um, just a few little things to start with. Uh, firstly, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place and elders both past and present. Uh, just a few housekeeping issues. I think, as we all know, mobiles on silent, please. Um, the the uh, amenities are located at the back, through the, through the doors on the back, for those who, who need them. And uh, the fire exits you'll see are also at the back of the hall here. And, and as you probably well know, as a public building, this is a no smoking environment. Like I said, this is a great turnout. I've got a feeling we might be heading for a record, which will be rather nice. Um, well, I must admit, when I first was told the numbers that were coming, I rechecked the invites in case there was a happy hour put on it that I'd missed. But I think what I, what I'm, I guess I've sensed is there's a, a bit of a turning point, I think, in the sentiment of the industry. Um, and it's come from a number of areas. Uh, I, I think a little bit to do with this new advanced Queensland program the government's running which is specifically targeting and funding initiatives in the uh, knowledge industry space. And also, I think we've seen both parties in Canberra also looking at and putting the digital economy and associated industries at the centre of their thinking. So I think the, I, I don't know if there's going to be a tsunami of checkbooks coming out, but I think there's a turning point. I think the, the flood is broken. So uh, let me just go through the... Um, uh, well, let's, before, we've just got a couple of announcements to make before we get into the programme. First of all, we have a thing called a speed networking event, which some of you may be aware of. Uh, this is an event um, that is aimed, is, it's sponsored by both the Department of Science, IT and Innovation and the AIIA. And the aim is to get players together, the industry, customers, academia and government together in a sort of a, a speed networking sort of event. Um, actually, the underpinning drive behind it is to try and beat the world record, which currently stands at 1,068 participants that the Belgian hold. So that'll be our target to try and beat that. So we're seeking some input from the industry on how best that activity can take place. And um, in preparing for the event, we will be uh, uh, seeking your input. You'll, you'll notice, remember, at the end of the exercise, at the end of the event today, when you go back, we do invite you to put in a respond to a questionnaire, what you thought of the day, helps us provide better services to you. But also on that, there's an extra question about some ideas you might have or how best to operate that speed networking activity. Okay, uh, just like to mention also to welcome our colleagues who are receiving us from streaming, many in Toowoomba and Tansville. Um, they'll also be able to offer questions at the panel session later on. A couple of other events I'd just like to mention is uh, that are happening over the next month or so. Click Digital is an event, annual event put on by the Regional Development Authority of Brisbane. They're holding their event um, on the Wednesday the 4th of December at the Convention Centre. There are some flyers at the desk on the way out you can pick up to, or, or just go on the web and, and click, uh, go click Digital. That's happening on the 4th of December. There's also at uh, QUT the uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers Chair in Digital Economy is running an event on the 9th of November at 5 o'clock called The Hidden Opportunities of Disruptive Innovation. If you go to the PwC Chair in Digital Economy website, you'll get full details of that activity as well. Okay, um, look, the format today, we have um, two uh, speakers, CIOs, uh, from agencies who will be talking about what their needs and their challenges are in their organisation and therefore opportunities for the industry. Um, so it's we pleased to welcome later on, we have Tim Dunn from the Housing and Public Works and Jensen Spencer from the uh, fairly recently formed Public Safety Business Agency. Then after that, we'll have um, some update on the GITC framework by Mark Cushing. He's the Executive Director of ICT Modernisation in the Department of Science, IT and Innovation. And Fahim Kondaka from BDO Australia, we're providing consultancy support for that particular activity. So, uh, without further ado, let me um, 
Oh, yes, uh, we do have a notification there. Uh, any questions, please send either from the floor here or those people who have been uh, streaming, please send on that uh, uh, SMS, on that mobile number, or on the um, hashtag go digital. And we will pick those up and be asking those questions to the panel later on. Just going through the, uh, the format of the presentation, um, we'll have th those three presentations. As I said, the last presentation is a, a double um, person presentation. Should finish just before 9 o'clock. Gives us time for about 15 or 20 minutes of Q&A. We'll do it from the front here. Also taking questions from our uh, live streaming audience as well. We'll then adjourn to the foyer. Um, no happy, I am afraid, but we'll adjourn to the foyer for some, some uh, tea, coffee, and refreshments. Um, and do some networking afterwards. So, I think I'd like to introduce our first speaker. It's Tim Dunn. Um, Tim is, uh, is normally the Chief Information Officer from the uh, Department of Housing and Public Works, but he's currently the Acting Assistant Director General of Corporate Services. I did check Tim before. He's quite happy for me to say that he's worked for 35 years um, in the Queensland Government. He's worked in shared service environment, um, taking on his role, his current role as uh, Chief Information Officer in 2011. Uh, Tim's responsible for strategic information management and the provision of information and communication technology services from Rabina to Thursday Island and Mount Isa to Sunshine Coast, which is an inter interesting way of dimensioning the state. Uh, Tim will be providing an overview of the pipeline of work within the P Department of Housing and Public Works. Will you please welcome Tim Dunn. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to see as many people here as we've got today. Um, I never realised that uh, I was uh, that famous, but that's brilliant uh, that everyone's gotten up so early to be here. Uh, of course, let me start uh, by um, talking a little bit about uh, the Department of Housing and Public Works. As the name suggests, um, we certainly have a focus around a range of housing, building and procurement services. Traditionally, the public works side of the department has certainly been around for a number of years. Uh, the housing part of the department, of course, joined us after the machinery of government changes from 2012. And uh, the introduction of housing or housing services has certainly changed the focus of our agency a little bit. Uh, whereas previously we were quite internally to government focused, delivering uh, things like the, the building maintenance services and the government motor vehicle fleet service. Um, the introduction of housing services certainly turned us into a far more outward focused uh, agency, delivering services uh, to the citizens of Queensland. So uh, in terms of that housing space, uh, to give some sort of dimension of scale to this, um, as Les said, we're delivering those services right across the state. But uh, right now we have about 55,000 properties that are leased or rented back to tenants uh, across the state. We're managing that tenancy for those, all of those properties. The state in addition owns approximately another 20,000 premises that are managed through community housing providers across the state. So a fairly substantial portfolio of property. In terms of a balance sheet impact, that's worth some $16 billion on the balance sheet of the state of Queensland. Um, and so in addition to that range of services is the more traditional services that come in the form of uh, an organisation that had for a long time been known as QBuild uh, within the state. And after the 2012 uh, changes, it went through a renaming and a, a reorganisation is now known as Building and Asset Services. And so BAS, um, amongst other things, delivers the property maintenance on those 55,000 properties that we have statewide. And BAS also uh, deliver a range of property maintenance services on most of government-owned building assets. So be that schools, courthouses, police stations, some of the health properties, particularly in the more regional areas. And some of the changes that have happened to that business has seen what was traditionally an outsourcing of approximately about 75% of their work to trade subcontractors. Uh, that's now closer to a 90% outsourcing of that property work. So you can imagine there is a fair bit of government to business uh, type uh, e-commerce transaction that goes on in terms of that build business. Uh, again, in terms of size, that business is 
is turns over around about $800 million on a per annum basis uh, conducting that property work. Um, I haven't just read the slides there, obviously you can find out a lot more about our department uh, via the website. So in simple terms, there's six major areas across our department. Um, we're about a, an organisation or a department of about 3,000 people. It's about 1,000 people that make up the housing services side of things. We have 23 housing service centres, as I say, distributed across the state that really are the front line of where tenants interact uh, with the department. So they represent about a third of the department. The building and asset services side of the department, again, about a third, about a thousand people. And the other one third then is made up of the, this group known as strategic asset management that takes in the business areas of Q Fleet, the government motor vehicle fleet uh, group. The government accommodation office that actually manages all of the office accommodation that the state uh, rents, leases, owns across the state is all coordinated through that group. And then more recently the government employee housing group after the 2012 changes, all of government employee housing was all centralised with this group within uh, our department and so that group is managing that portfolio of, of properties as well. Building Industry and Policy Group uh, takes care of a range of uh, legislation that impacts on the building industry, uh, things such as the building codes. The Procurement Transformation Division, you would be aware of um, their involvement uh, across the state. And of course the Corporate Services Group. So again, uh, those groups combined are, about, are worth uh, in total about a third in terms of the impact on the organisation. Some of the uh, ICT component of our department. Um, I'm quite proud to be able to say that uh, we are now uh, a very contemporary type platform. Uh, we've gone through a significant transformation over the last couple of years and lifted ourselves out of the uh, quagmire that was left in terms of the Windows XP challenge gone through a transformation into Windows 7 and now just at the tail end of uh, 8.1 deployment. We're uh, a hybrid arrangement of, uh, I guess, on-premise Office 2013 as well as uh, Office 365 and that transformation across into Office 365 will continue into next year. It's about 3,500 devices that we have statewide and about a third of those are mobile devices, laptops and tablets and as part of that deployment we've introduced um, the mobility capability so that people with those tablet laptop devices are out in the field uh, and using uh, technology are able to get direct access straight back into the corporate environment and that's proving to be uh, an, a real win for the organisation for those field officers that are out in the field, um, be that in a property maintenance perspective or a housing tenancy perspective, they're able to complete uh, work while they're in the field without having to return back to the office. Something that I know that most of you have probably been living with for many years now, but something that was a complete uh, challenge for us, particularly on an XP type platform. Uh, and so that's proving to be a real bonus, as I say. The challenge, I think, for the business is understanding how they can then take this technology and apply it to what has been quite outdated business practices and processes. And so they're still coming to terms about how they can adapt and change. And of course, like, like most large organisations, we have um, enterprise solutions back at the core of our environment that are very difficult to make uh, rapid changes to and very challenging to adapt to this very mobile type approach. As you see there, about 5,000 servers, 70 different network sites, so many links, of course, to manage all of that. Our environment is, in fact, a virtual environment. Uh, we do not own, I'm very proud to be able to say, I, in my five years, in fact, that I've been there, uh, to my the best of my knowledge, I have not signed off and bought any filed servers as such. Uh, we buy uh, virtual infrastructure at the moment. Uh, all of our uh, environment is largely uh, based with SciTech as a virtual environment. Uh, the housing environment that we've migrated out of the former Department of Communities, uh, we're currently in the process of migrating that um, into the, the Microsoft Azure space. Uh, and I guess we're looking to that as a bit of a platform for us into the future. 
Um, part of that migration into the Windows uh, 7 and the 08.1 environment saw us reduce our application platform from in excess of 4,000 applications out there to now more like 450. Uh, and so again, that's helping us to um, maintain a, a very managed environment that's quite consistent and reliable. Some of the projects that uh, are currently underway within the department is the replacement of our uh, housing solution. Uh, simply that is uh, a legacy SAP environment for those that are interested, SAP 46C, uh, that in fact was implemented to 46C as a technical upgrade from a 3.1x implementation dating back to about 98. So the business practices and processes in that housing space are largely based on practices from the 1990s which is very different, of course, to today's environment. And uh, we find that our customer base today in the year 2015 is a very different customer base than what it was in the 1990s. And so uh, we're in the process of replacing that. We went through uh, a very long and arduous procurement uh, process that finished in contracts being signed with a vendor uh, last year in December. So this year has been the commencement of that implementation phase that is likely to be uh, something like about a three-year implementation phase, um, implementation project with multiple phases of go live uh, as we make sure that we manage the risk with that implementation. Very large project, we've got about 60 people at the moment dedicated to that um, and um, as I say, that's working closely with the vendor, which is uh, unfortunately no Australian company, a UK-based company, Northgate Public Services, that at least um, we will not be uh, owning that solution. We will be buying it as a hosted managed service uh, from that vendor. Uh, and the good news from my perspective is at its core, it is a social housing solution. It is not a finance system that's been customised to be able to deliver functionality. First and foremost, it delivers social housing, which is the business that we're in, and it delivers those outcomes. And our focus through the entire procurement phase was to focus on outcomes as opposed to deliver three lever arch folders of business requirements and then go to market thinking we could get a solution that matched these archaic business requirements. As I say, uh, housing desktop and network upgrade uh, this week saw uh, the migration of the Thursday Island Office of Housing uh, off of the community's environment and onto a HBW environment, a Windows 8.1 deployment with a number of tablets uh, and or laptops that would have been deployed into that environment. That's the last of those uh, major housing service centres. We've got two remote locations still to go uh, in Woorabinda, where I think we've got two people and another small office outside of Mount Isa again where there's about uh, a half a dozen people. So they'll be finished off be, uh, next week by the end of October. Then we focus on the back end environment for uh, the housing environment with a view to have that migrated away from my colleagues at uh, the Department of Communities, Child Safety, Disability Services before Christmas. Part of our improvement, of course, with uh, the mobility has seen a deployment of uh, wireless environment. Uh, again, the take up and the um, the desire for mobility has been quite insatiable uh, and uh, we've got a solution in place that's delivering that. A little challenging for us, we've got a lot of people in 80 George Street. That building is part of the new redevelopment that will occur uh, and so in fact um, it won't be too much longer before the department will be having to decant from that building, uh, probably about 12 months. And so uh, we're obviously not trying to invest too much in infrastructure in that building because we won't be there for much longer. And as I say, we're certainly uh, dabbling in terms of cloud environments and I think advantage because of the fact that we already operate in a virtual world. In terms of future projects, building and asset services today run uh, the, uh, I guess when we implemented what was a MinCom solution, the Ellipse ERP, today uh, ABB. And so that current solution was implemented in 2009 and so it's time for that to be refreshed. As I alluded to, the business of building and asset services has also transformed somewhat to a situation today where, relatively speaking, the business itself does not actually go out on the job with the tools and do the job, 
but rather they outsource a lot of that activity. So there is a little bit of a question mark, I guess, around the role that Ellipse plays and what the future uh, appropriate ERP solution might be for building an asset services. So there's certainly uh, work in the future pipeline uh, for their solution. Qfleet, the motor vehicle uh, fleet leasing arrangements for Queensland Government managed by Qfleet, again runs on a, on a very old legacy uh, application solution uh, and Government needs to decide and we will be progressing uh, the replacement of that existing legacy solution. Certainly um, an upgrade of that solution is not a, a possibility, it will be a replacement of that. Out of our uh, strategic uh, plan, uh, we've certainly got a range of security projects, the, sec the strategic plan itself, um, identifying activities where we uh, want to increase the use of our mobility platform that we have in place. Um, we've got Skype for Business out there and I think we're still learning how we can actually apply and use that. At the moment our Office 365 environment is based still out of Singapore. So there's some latency uh, concerns, I guess, particularly out from our regional offices. So we're certainly looking forward to when our 365 environment will come onshore uh, and we want to try and then ramp up the deployment and the use of the additional technology that comes, uh, comes in that environment. Um, the information security activities relate to, uh, we certainly did a lot of work improving our security posture. Uh, with the G20 as that came around, as I know a lot of organisations did. Uh, but we'd like to continue to progress that work. Um, we're doing work in the data loss prevention space uh, and we're still investigating that. Security assurance solutions, we have monitoring in place at the moment, but again, fairly rudimentary and uh, we think we can probably um, turn the volume up a little bit on exactly what we're doing in that space. Like all organisations, we're uh, looking to a digital business transformation strategy and developing that activity uh, in, the, in conjunction with ICT modernisation. A range of activities such as print and image as a service is absolutely on the agenda for us. Again, it's one of those things that's a little bit awkward knowing that we've got a major shift uh, happening as we all have to decant uh, 80 George Street. The timing of that uh, becomes very important. Um, the exploitation of the Office 365 environment with SharePoint Online. We are a SharePoint site. Um, we have a big investment at the moment in our virtual infrastructure and managing that SharePoint. And clearly we can make a lot of uh, efficiency savings by leveraging the SharePoint Online capability that we can get access to. We've dabbled in the development of customer facing digital solutions. Some of you may be aware we've developed um, a housing assist app that's available across all platforms that's specifically targeted at the customers of housing services. Um, I did mention that, that, that sheer volume as well as tenants um, on an annual basis, housing services uh, assist literally thousands of Queenslanders uh, make their way into private rental arrangements as well. It's a range of products, things like bond loans. So you can imagine a young person may well have the wherewithal and the finances to pay their weekly rent, but they haven't got the $2,500 sitting there to put the bond down into the property. They haven't got a rental history. Um, by uh, giving a, a bond loan to that individual, it gives them a start. Um, if we were to put somebody into social housing, the subsidy on an annual basis is worth about $7,500 on a per annual basis, and the average tenancy is about seven and a half years. Alternatively, we can provide a bond loan that the tenant is expected to pay back. We provide a one-off bond loan of a couple of thousand dollars. That person gets into private rentals, they get on the treadmill of life and they're away. It's a much better outcome for all of us if we can assist people in that way. And we do assist thousands of Queenslanders to do that. So this app allows those individuals off their mobile phone to get the current balance uh, of their bond loan. We had that available online and it's been progressed through to being um, now available off of an app, as well as uh, a range of other activities all the way through to submitting a maintenance request on, the, on your property. If you are a tenant, you can submit a maintenance request via that app as well. So we've dabbled in that space. Uh, we've done a little bit of development in-house at the moment uh, in terms of the uh, building and asset services space, that um, government to business type interaction, subcontractors have an app 
that interacts with uh, the, the execution of business. But we're well aware that there's a lot more work that uh, we'll be able to do in that space, and certainly that will be improved as we look to change the back-end environments that run those very large organisations. Um, the other little bit of work that we are, are wanting to focus on as we move from a, uh, a traditional environment, albeit it's virtualised, but our application lifecycle management in terms of our environment is still very much a traditional type approach. And we recognise we need to adapt and change that suits more the cloud environment, the lifecycle approach that we uh, take with our application environment. So we're well aware that we've got um, a range of work to do to look at uh, how we change our approach to application lifecycle management such that it's far more contemporary uh, for a modern uh, cloud environment. So um, that's as much as uh, I was going to go into this morning, um, and thanks very much. Thanks, Tim. It always amazes me that um, the government has as many houses as there are in Townsville or Toowoomba. It's quite incredible. Um, look, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Jensen Spencer. Uh, Jensen is the CIO of the Public Safety Business Agency in Queensland and is responsible for the statewide, including uh, the Triple O system for Queensland Police, Fire and Emergency Service and Ambulance. The Public Service Business Agency, PSBA, it's a relatively new agency which is um, taken to consolidate technology for its frontline agencies and provide new efficiencies, including critical information sharing, which support improvements in public safety. So uh, Jensen will provide an overview of frontline digital services operating and the priorities coming up for the next 12 months. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, firstly what I thought I'd do is give a rundown of our group and what we do and what we look after because it is unique. Um, we're the only national organisation that's responsible for the entire triple zero stack and uh, that comes with a lot of opportunity I guess which you guys are going to be interested in. Um, PSBA was formally created uh, July 1st last year when the DCS, ex um, yeah, DCS site ambulance and fire and police IT teams came together. So we are relatively new, we're about a year and a half old. When we came together, we were looking down the barrel of G20. Um, so we had four months to basically get our backyard in order for a, a unique event. And we had, we were in a very, fairly average state at that point with, you know, thousands of servers unpatched, operating systems unsupported, um, vulnerabilities everywhere, and we worked with QGCIO and other government agencies to all tighten up, and it was actually a really good way to bring two teams together. We had a, a deadline that wasn't going to move. We had a lot of work to do. We had two competing cultures, one of a conservative organisation versus a one that is a little bit you know, out there in terms of, let's not plan it, let's do it. So throwing all them in the hot pot together was a great opportunity for us to actually come together a lot quickly that we would have otherwise. Um, with the, the, the unique part of what we do as well is that, as you know, our QAS are part of, are part of health now, but all of their IT is, remains within our organisation and that's not only the triple zero and operational uh, systems they have but also the corporate back end as well and we are working with them on where they end up with some of their systems whether they stay with us or go to third parties or, or migrate to to health we're the big user base um, particularly with the MOG as well that the last MOG with fire is they also took on the volunteers and the SES so that kind of extended their organization from 3,000 to up around 80,000 and uh, there's obviously a, the, the volunteers, particularly around what happened last night with storms and also disasters, uh, information sharing with, with those uh, organisations is just becoming critical. So there's, a, there's a, a big push for us to be able to provide new contemporary tools for those, for those volunteers with information in their hand. The, um, the other unique part of what we do, I guess, in terms of a traditional IT shop, is radio. So we, many of you are aware of the GWN currently rolling out now and it's, it's started well and that's going through 
the southeast corner of Queensland. We also have the rest of the state, which is primarily an analogue network. We've got four networks, police, ambulance, fire and the SES. And government's sort of working more strategically on whether or not what, what, what we do with that all of state um, communication. And it is probably the most critical thing we do, radio comms. Um, when any of you call triple zero, the communication back to a police, fire and ambulance is done via radio mostly. And, you know, that's a, a critical critical service that, that we provide um, to the, to the frontline users. Um, we receive obviously a lot of calls. We also, Police Link do have high numbers as well in terms of uh, calls that come through, come through to them. And you can see there that you know, we, we do have a fairly big team and they're scattered everywhere. Um, there's seven largest locations here in Brisbane and then we've got them regionally placed uh, across the state. And you can see that our operational budget is you know, 175 million. There are um, other elements to what we do and support though that the actual funding and budget money sits in the agencies. So our actual operational budget in terms of how we keep frontline humming for the state is, is a little bit higher than that. And then on top of that, we've obviously got all of our capital programs and projects. You can see there also, we're, we're trying to be more contemporary than traditional sort of information technology. We've, we've aligned our name with what we're there to do and to be relevant, and we are there to provide frontline support. And that's sort of part of our new contemporary model in our, in our business plan in making sure that we remain relevant and can actually be more in partnership with those agencies as opposed to a service provider or a shared service. Um, I think I might have skipped, no I didn't skip one. All right, so we're, we're trying to, I guess, create an identity for, for us and what we do. A lot of our staff came from a, you know, from police or fire obviously and they've got a, a strong identity with uniforms etc and, and we're trying to create one as well. And, and what we're trying to be is we want to connect everything, everyone, everywhere. So everything we do strategically sort of falls under those, under those, I guess, little reminders of what we're, what we're here to do. Uh, very quickly, from a structure point of view, some of you know this, some of you don't. We've got a simple engage, design, build, operate model. Um, so that's pretty standard um, in, in, in IT. Probably the the three little different parts to, to, our, to our structure, which is part of our new business model, I guess, is we've pulled security out and escalated it, um, pulled it out of a traditional networking or ops team. Security's a lot bigger than that now. We, G, uh, we learnt that through G20. It's actually broken up into three teams. We've got the your traditional security access control guys. We've also got, we've got systems in place that the guys are full-time detecting and responding to targeted malicious malware, et cetera. It's a full-time job for a number of people in our organisation. Uh, and, the, and the third part is to comply with um, standards and also educate. So we're putting in a big education program for our users continually and looking at new ways to them to be aware of uh, security threats and vulnerabilities and what they're what we want them to take on in terms of responsibility uh, going forward. So we use a lot of infographics and animation to get our messages through as opposed to a big thumping policy document that nobody reads. Um, so that's, that's working quite well. And, and during G20, you know, we, uh, government in general, we had a very successful, I guess, achievement there. I think it was the first G event and global sporting event where there were no cyber incidents, at least in my area. Um, but we, we saw, we did see attempts and there was all sorts of things going on and when we picked it up, we had key loggers on our, on our media machines. So um, essentially those media machines access social media and there was probably the, the strong chance that the QPS social media um, service was, was a target by somebody. So we, we, we've got all the tools in place now to monitor and manage that a little bit better than we did. In the comply, section as well. We're going through the process of being ISO 27001 certified and that's on track to be done this year. So our critical sensitive systems, we're going up and beyond the government's ISO um, 18 and going into a global 27001 and um, 
as I said, this time of, well, by December, we're on track to actually be certified, and I believe we'd probably be the first Queensland government to have achieved that in a very complicated environment. So those two things are something we're pretty proud of as an organisation. The other really different thing to our model is the, um, the two little boxes in the middle, the integrate and optimise, with the opportunity that we have with having the one technology stack, uh, eight, three technology stacks under one environment. It opens up a lot of opportunity for us to integrate. Um, integrate our, our information and share our information with Frontline. Can police see where the AMBOs are and fire is? When there's a big car accident, all three turn up. They all do their own individual processes of, they fill out three separate forms and can't see each other and chew up radio and, um, and phone to try and find out where each other are. If we can integrate that all into their, their uh, personal devices, um, that's gonna free up a lot of uh, air uh, radio as well, and so that's that's an area that we're just focusing on. Where do we add value? How do we continually try and glue things together that are going to make a big difference? And the optimised area is a new is a is a new team that we've put in. It's called Platinum Services, and what we did is with all the systems we've got, which is lots, we we actually circled the ones that if they went down, is anyone's life at risk? And we escalated those up to a platinum team. And what that team, those, they, there's only 10 or 12 people in there. They're hand-picked. They're the A team. And um, they know the system inside and out. And what they've done is they've mapped from a business perspective end to end. So when triple zero comes in, you making your call, the phone system, through to the operator taking it, the databases, the storage, the servers, the networks, the security, through to dispatching. They know that system inside out. They know all the contracts where they sit, how the vendors are performing, where we're wobbly, what needs replacing, and it's a, it's a team that's looking, I guess, it's like an internal audit function that's there to continually improve their most critical services, and that's working really well. And how that, you, you see there that in all structures are generally vertical, so you've got your directors and your technical teams all sort of vertically. Well, that team kind of cuts through all that and basically almost has veto across all the technical team people they need from a business perspective to continually make sure that those systems are where they need to be. So that's been a really um, a successful part of our, of our structure. I've just talked through that. So here's some of the, um, I guess, the platinum. That, that little infographic picture there, that's just to show you an example of ambulance and fire, um, CAD system and all the components. It's a hugely complex uh, environment. And um, we've now, we, we didn't have all this data, we didn't know where all the system servers, were they, you know, were they needing refresh, were they wobbly, how many times have they been falling over? So we've got really good visibility and, and, and our targets are to, you know, make this stack very stable and, um, and keep it running for everybody and at some point you would have used it or you're going to need it. So we want to make sure it's working. So there's some of the systems there. Well, you can see that email and mobility uh, have been a, are definitely one of those ones that we've thrown in that bucket, and we chose to do that. We did, these aren't, these weren't sort of negotiated with the business. We had enough knowledge to know what this was, and we validated it, and, and it was right. The mobility one, I'm sure most people have been through that, that conversation with the business of, um, you know, how important is email? Oh, it's not very, and then when it goes down, everyone's crying, um, and you know, we can't operate without it. So we we escalated that. Um, and because the, the devices now that everybody has with the information and, and on it um, is life-saving as well, so we've, we've put that one in there. Um, some, some of the bigger projects that, that we are working on, some of you are aware of this, the mobile services program. So that's been, I guess, one that's been targeted as a police-only, uh, you may have had the Q-Light devices, so it's essentially um, giving police, frontline police awareness information on who the person is, their background, your car, it, it taps into TMR's um, information as well in terms of your, your licence picture. So you can't lie anymore in terms of you, can, you, 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 you don't have a licence and you give them someone else's name, they're going to know. Um, so that, that program there has been targeting sort of iPads and applications for frontline. Early next year, you'll see that expand, and we're actually going to try and remove the whole mobility wording and go doing the more um, work anywhere, um, because we want to get away from the device in terms of whether it being an iPad. We're going to open things up to uh, sort of 
a multi-hardware platform, bring what you want, use what you want. The, the business areas now are, are looking at us for BYOD, uh, where, where that just changes the traditional approach of particularly in policing of how, how we've built things and operated. Um, we've been working with the, the PSN uh, as well in how that, that changes our network in terms of a work anywhere environment means that we, we no longer can lock everything behind a firewall. We need to use cloud-based services, open things up a little bit, use application-based security, have internet in every site, not have a hub and spoke internet feed because it just, it just won't work. So that's, gonna, that's really going to change transform the way our frontline agencies have traditionally operated and we're really excited by that one so you'll you'll hear and see more about how that opens up and also from a vendor point of view the the systems and software we have on the back back end need to be mobile dev device agnostic and byod friendly we can't be building clunky back end systems that need a fat client and need upgrading every 18 months it's just we, we're moving from that from that area. Uh, the we've got a tech refresh going on in our in our CAD space, um, which is which is underway. It's just a hardware software refresh. Uh, the other big ones I won't go through all those ones there. There's a couple of missing as well. Um, the I talked about the SES TAMs, so that's essentially mobilising our SES task force, giving them the information of tasking. So, you know, one day if the storm goes through your place and there's a hole in your roof and you can actually get help through the app now that we've created, the actual volunteer actually has that information on an app as well and they're not sort of tasked through faxes, fax and paperwork and have to fill out job reports, which is currently what they do. Um, EVP is an exciting one. I don't know whether many of you know about this one. It's won a number of global awards. Essentially what that is is it's a, it, it, it changes red lights to green lights on a route to get somebody or, or you know, get somewhere. So we're rolling more and more of that out. So if an ambulance, a fire truck or a police officer needs to get somewhere quickly, um, we have a system in the car that basically works in with TMR and changes red lights to green lights to make right of passage. And uh, that's also that the statistics on that are, are massive in terms of how many intercepts we do and what the value uh, is in terms of a, an ambulance getting there, even 10, 20 seconds quicker than what it would have with a been stuck in red lights and trying to weave through weave through traffic. The other big one that's not on the list, don't know how it didn't get there, is body worn video. Um, that's a massive challenge for us. We've got a big state, lots of police. It's not the technology though that's probably the big challenge, it's how they're going to use it and some of the rules and le legislation and um, just operationally what you've got 10,000 police on eight hour shifts. Do they record the whole shift? Um, how do we get, how do we get um, data, gigs of data or terabytes of data from Aracoon? back somewhere where it can be stored securely, example like that. So there's, there's technology challenges, but I think the bigger one is how the business are gonna use it. Uh, and then internally ourselves is that we're taking that leap of faith into, because um, PSBA was quickly sort of rustled together, where um, we're now looking at building, we're, we're looking at a greenfields environment where if we were to build a new organisation in a contemporary world, how would that look from a business domain point of view or a business IT environment point of view? So we're starting next year, early next year, we're gonna build this contemporary workspace where you can work anywhere, where you can bring your own device, where you can collaborate more easily, um, where you can share, share files a lot more easier than you know, using file shares or emailing them around. Um, and we're going to set that up in terms of for PSPA. We'll migrate PSBA, PSBA staff into that work, uh, new um, domain workspace, and um, and then that would be the template. We'll shake out all the little bugs in that, and that'll be the template for the rest of the portfolio going forward. Um, I mentioned the mobile services program. So yeah, we're, we're whilst there, the program's talking about you know the 5,000 devices. Um, we're basically, by 2018, we want every police officer to turn up with a device, whether we supply it or they bring it, given the choice. 
and we don't really care if it's a Microsoft, an Android, or a, or a uh, or an Apple. That's that's where we're where we're heading. So that that scope's going to get a lot broader. Um, I'll just skip through these to save the um, the, the the HADR at Kedron is one where we've sort of come in and, and we just uh, where the, the the data centre for ambulance, so the primary data centre for ambulance and um, and fire is it located at Kedron and we really need that that dual side approach for a number of some of the systems are there, CAD's there, so triple zero's there, but there's all those other platinum ones there's, that there currently aren't. So we're we're in a we're doing a lot of work to try and rectify that. Um, mention those. The other one too is we've because we're a new agency and we've come together quickly, we've got a fair bit of change fatigue going on in our organisation. There's we've had four significant changes, I guess, from with a change of government, new agency, um, the LMP did the public service cuts. So it's, it's just been this continual change. So we, we've actually done a lot of uh, work with our own staff to look at what do they want in, in our environment. Um, and yeah, we've essentially got 25 commitments that we've given our staff, which are, some of them are, are little things, like, believe it or not, what's my new position description? Um, through to more bigger things like I want to bring my own device and work anywhere. So there's a big range of them, but we've, we've, we're working through that now, and, and that's um, been running since July. And by December, we'll have 13 of those uh, knocked off. Um, probably, oh, the other big one too, the, the vendor and contract management. When we, when we came together, we, um, we basically inherited a whole heap, of, uh, whole heap of contracts, and we didn't know, they were often just ticked over in terms of um, renewals, and we weren't even reviewing them, and some of them we didn't even know they were there. But we've got, in that platinum space as an example where we're focusing, we've got 44 vendor contracts that support us in providing life and death type systems. So we're working with each of those suppliers to make sure that we're both you know, well aligned, and we really want to lift the profile in terms of partnering with, with suppliers. We, you know, are, are we looking to outsource stuff? Well, if you, you can do it better than we can, absolutely. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the approach that we're taking. We're not saying we've got to outsource all this stuff. It's a, can we, or is a hybrid approach better for the state? Um, is a layer that you can put on our team gonna provide everybody a better service? So we're going through that now, um, and as I said, starting in platinum, and that's uh, hopefully gonna bring us closer to industry work better with industry and also provide a better outcome for, for everybody. So that was pretty much it for me. Hopefully clawed back some of Tim's time. Thanks, Jensen. And um, yeah, I, I think just to, um, to congratulate the PSBA, they did get a lot of accolade for the G20, global accolade for the, um, what happened at G20 or what didn't happen at G20. And I guess I'd just also like to offer myself as a volunteer for the red-green traffic light device if, if uh, that's required. Um, look, for our last presentation, we're running a little bit behind the clock, but I think there's some interesting content here, so we're, we're quite keen to make sure we can get all things uh, presented to you. So at last, we've got two speakers. We're going to be talking on the GITC framework update. Uh, first of all, we'll have Mark Cushing, who's the Executive Director of ICT Modernisation Program and former Chief Information Officer of State Development Infrastructure and Planning. Um, Mark has over 20 years. You had up the experience in the, in the, of the speakers today, and I think we're, we're probably clo closing on 70 or 80 years of uh, experience in, the, in this whole space. So Mark has 20 years experience across a number of government portfolios in project delivery, infrastructure development, disaster management. And uh, joining Mark on the platform today will be um, Fahim Kondaka. And Fahim is uh, from BDO. He's a principal advisor of data analytics and insights at BDO. As most of you know, BDO is one of the largest associations of independently owned accounting practices who deal with accountancy and tax issues in Australia. And Fahim has got extensive uh, background in economics, finance, and uh, technology as well. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, Mark and Fahim to the uh, table to speak collectively to you on the, uh, the whole GITC framework. Thank you. Uh, 
thanks Les for that. Um, also like to acknowledge Fahim, our uh, BDO, our business partners with us in this review, um, independent review. Um, first I'd like to talk about the background. Um, so the question that we're asking ourselves a lot uh, in government is, um, so what is the right contracting framework uh, for ICT procurement for Queensland? Uh, we've been asking ourselves that question for quite a while. Um, and I suppose through a number of drivers to the ICT modernisation plan, which I'm leading, and also the ICT engagement plan, which a lot of you guys have participated in, um, a lot of issues around GITC kept bubbling up to the um, surface. Um, so part of um, the work that um, we've engaged BDO to do was to make sure that there was an independent review done. Um, I particularly, as a representative of the city, wanted to stand back from this and let government and industry come together to actually design what that new framework might look like um, and actually unpack some of those barriers for us. Um, I'll try and get through the government context pretty quickly, given that uh, both Jensen and Tim took most of the time today, um, so that Fahim can get to the meat of the uh, results. But obviously BDO were engaged in May and August to conduct this independent review. There's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of engagement to occur. Um, and as I said before, um, this was very much a co-design process. Um, really wanted to make sure this was uh, independent but also the fact that um, we in the city had no preconceived ideas of what this would or um, should look like. Um, some of the key objectives you can see on the screen there. Um, the first one was about reducing cost um, of doing business with government for both um, yourselves and um, with both industry and government. The costs are quite uh, huge when we, when we think about it and Fahim will get into a bit more of that detail soon. And but also, um, while our GITC contracting framework is quite sound and currently protects our interests, um, we, we sort of recognise it's not the most efficient or effective way for us to move forward in doing business. This leads me to the um, second point there with the little dude running along with his blue suitcase. Um, the key objectives of this was to actually try and make things a little bit simpler and quicker um, uh, so that we can get on with doing business much faster than what we have in the past and hopefully that the framework that we currently have can be simplified a little bit better. It's also important to recognise that the changes or modifications to that framework still retain the adequate protections for both parties. And we're also looking for greater flexibility um, in contracting to accommodate future uh, innovative emerging IC technologies. I think we recognise that the current framework is um, uh, not enabling us to take on some of those emerging trends or disruptive technologies because of some of the barriers in the framework. Now, I've got some weird, last time I did this, animations played up with me. Um, we took a three-stage approach to um, engaging with both uh, industry and government. The first stage involved um, stakeholder interviews and workshops with 54 supplier companies and all of the government agencies were invited to participate. Now of those 54, 13 supplier companies attended, including legal firms, uh, 10 government customer agencies, and seven other GITC users like SEQ Water and University of Queensland participated in the process as well. The second stage uh, involved a pretty comprehensive survey. Um, it was sent to over 1,500 suppliers and also to 159 GITC users. Um, we were looking to provide more insights into any improvements we could make in the GITC framework. So of that uh, 1,500, 25% or 381 suppliers responded with their views and 70% of GITC users representing about 111 participated also. I think you'll agree from those numbers that um, that's a quite, a quite a high level of engagement from both government and industry and in what this new framework will look like. Uh, the third stage uh, involved co-design workshops, as I previously said, and these workshops consisted of seven suppliers, six legal firms, including Crown Law, and 11 government customer agencies. Um, so look, without further ado, I think we might get into the, the bones of the, um, the findings, and I'll hand it over to Fahim. Thanks, Mark, and morning, everyone. I'll jump straight into it. Okay, um, so what we decided to do as BDO in, this, uh, in our approach to this was to consider the framework in the form of a spectrum. Start with what we have currently as option one, which is status quo, 
and take it to the full spectrum of removing a centralized IT procurement framework in terms of contracting. Um, so it wouldn't be just haphazard, but it would be basically removing ICT as a mega category and ICT gets procured as a general goods and services for government. And that was option, option four, excuse me. And then what we decided to do was during our consultation process, which Mark went through, was to work out where the options fit in between those two end of the spectrum. And we came up with two that pretty much the consultation and the approach led to. Option two that we have on here is to look at the terms of the current GRTC contract and look at the key pain points and just modify and tweak those. So go through the process of reviewing and doing a legal review and working out exactly where the issues are and see if we can modify those. And option three that we've put up here was a severe modification where you almost get into a new framework completely. Um, we then took an approach of evaluation which was based on multiple criteria and we didn't want to be accused of favoring one over the other so we took quite a comprehensive approach to that and I'll show you what that looked like. Uh, before I jump onto that as well, I just wanted to reiterate that consultation process. Um, the surveys were anonymous, but from the consultations, the one-on-one -on -one consultations and workshops we had, we did have a few people who were willing to give their names on there. Um, it'll be a good test of your flags as well. We looked at other jurisdictions, uh, both interstate and internationally. Uh, New Zealand, UK, Germany were international. Um, Western Australia, South Australia, and Victoria were the interstate jurisdictions that we looked at their practices. As Mark mentioned, we also looked at advisors, so legal advisors and other advisors involved in the process as well and got their feedback as well. So as I mentioned, we had quite a extensive criteria um, and it was quite a robust holistic process. So the criteria were based initially on government principles uh, and objectives that Mark went through as well as throughout the consultations we modified the criteria based on industry um, feedback as well. And the approaches we took, um, stakeholder impact was one component, the financial outcome was obviously an a component, the flexibility of the contract and that's in terms of flexibility of with using different contracts as well as flexibility to deal with different emerging innovative technologies. Um, best practice, as I said, we looked at other jurisdictions. Uh, implementation risk, so we obviously didn't want to come up with something great that was very difficult to implement. And the final thing was the whole of government impact. Uh, Tim obviously went through what HPW is doing in the procurement space. Um, government as a whole has some ideas on um, and strategies on procurement, so we were very clear and very um, careful to make sure that whatever we came up with did not contradict that. The next diagram is going to be slightly complicated and very difficult to read from the back there, so I'm just going to talk about it at a high level before we delve into it. Essentially what it highlights is seven steps to procurement. It starts from, yes, I need something, to sign the contract to get that something. Steps two, three, and four is the space that we worked in, which is the contract selection. So step one, I need to work out whether I need something. Step two, three, four is the contract that I'm going to use when I go procure my something. Step five here is essentially the selection of the suppliers. So go out to market if you need to and do that competitive uh, selection process. Step six is accreditation, um, and step seven is the contract execution. Now, step six with the accreditation, uh, supply selection, and the needs analysis, all three of those were out of scope for BDO. Our focus was on the contracting element of the entire pro uh, contract selection and the contract itself. However, in the feedback, while we were getting feedback, we thought we'd just ask the questions um, and see what the industry position is there, because obviously the two areas are quite integral and quite linked. The one thing I'll just mention here is that accreditation, uh, as you know, government currently has a two-step accreditation process. There's um, accreditation through QAssure and one through internal GRTC accreditation as well. Um, the feedback was quite um, clear that a single-step approach would be, would be preferred, and when Mark goes through the next steps, he'll mention that that's one of the things that's being looked at um, in the consultation for the next steps as well. Um, so I'll dive into this middle... Oh, so, sorry. Um, I'll dive into this middle bit again. 
There we go. All right, the laser pointer button's green as well. Um, the contract selection bit. Okay, contract selection, again, before we go through the flow chart, it's essentially just a flow chart. There are effectively three or four options. You can end up in a very highly complex contract, so there's the bespoke contracting option. There are standing off arrangements and panel arrangements, there's that option. And then currently there's the GRTC framework as the option. We looked at that, those three options and we looked at how best government could go about selecting the most appropriate framework. So what we've introduced very early on in the piece is a risk assessment tool. And basically what we've said is if it's a very high risk type of contract, so your GWNs for example, no form of standard contract is going to ever be able to cater to that, so stick to your base bespoke contracting for those high risk areas. And then if you end up in a situation where you have low to moderate risk, uh, we move down to step two. You look for whether there's a panel arrangement or a standing off arrangement. If there's a panel arrangement and standing off arrangement, go with that panel, panel arrangement or standing off arrangement type contract. If there isn't one, we've now, this is where we've done some work in terms of analyzing the feedback. We've sort of split the products being procured or products and services being procured in terms of risk. If it's very low, low, low risk, low value items, and risk, and that's quite important as well. Value doesn't necessarily relate to risk. You could have a very critical piece that's really cheap as well. So it's important to factor that in. Um, but if, you, if we have a low risk, low value item, our suggestion is one standardized contract for that sort of category. Um, low value, we've looked at the data and I've sort of alluded to it by sl skipping across to another slide accidentally. One million dollars seemed to be the sweet spot for the, from, based on the data for the threshold for Queensland. Um, but that's still up for consultation. Nothing's been locked in in that, um, in that regard. Um, and then the second bit is low risk above that threshold or moderate risk. And again, we suggest that there should be another standardized set of contract for that sort of, that sort of uh, category. And then after that, once you've selected your contract, I've got my three minute warning, um, once you've selected your contract, uh, Basically, you go through your supplier process, your procurement process, your agency guidelines. The one area, one additional area that we've got up there is the acceptance of vendor terms and conditions. So products like Dropbox, Apple iCloud, or Salesforce, or something like that we are all used to in the outside of government that we can all pretty much use our credit card and purchase. Uh, they have these long terms and conditions which usually they don't want to negotiate. And government is now looking at that option of defining some guidelines on where those terms and conditions would be acceptable as well. And again, that'll go through that next step of consultation as well. And obviously, that's what we've still indicated here with a dotted line in the workflow. Um, obviously, if you're going to accept vendor terms and conditions, they would skip the accreditation process because you wouldn't then go and ask Dropbox or someone like that to then get accredited with the Queensland government for GRTC accreditation or maybe you might if that's what the industry feedback is. So that's essentially it in a nutshell. Um, why, where's the opportunity in this? Um, well the opportunity is in two areas. One is efficient timing, procurement time, efficiencies in that, uh, reduced negotiation lag and that sort of thing. And the other one is risk allocation. Obviously appropriate risk allocation allows lower risk premiums and both of those lead to financial outcomes and better, better opportunities for both industry and government. Um, the statistic up there, 90% of the volume of contracts that Queensland government spends typically in a year um, is less than $1 million um, and about 40% of the value of the contracts that are signed are less than $1 million contracts. So there's a pretty big opportunity there to use the two uh, new moderate contracts, uh, new general contracts that we're proposing. Um, at that point, I think I'll hand over back to Mark for the next steps. Thanks, Fahim. So, what are our next steps? Um, over the next four months, we'll be um, still progressing, um, developing the draft new contracts, including uh, short form and general form. And this will be also co-designed um, with, co uh, with a core group of participants. Um, we'll be developing draft guidelines uh, for using um, vendor terms and conditions. And this will also be co-designed uh, once again with a core group of participants. 
We'll also be progress progressing with our contract uh, pathway decision prototype um, and still unpacking further um, the uh, single or pre-qualification uh, accreditation model needs a bit more work and consultation done on that. So then the next, uh, on that little diagram, the next six to eight months um, we'll be out again consulting more widely with industry and government stakeholders to revise the draft um, or simplified contracts. Um, first of all, we want to put the sort of um, the skeleton together and then the, uh, and then the flesh on the bone. Um, and so also we'll be going out and um, engaging much more broadly with what those T's and C um, guidelines might look like and the um, contract pathway decision prototype. Uh, also in that six to eight months period will be a big part of transition planning. Um, we're doing a fair bit of planning in that space. And in the final four months, um, God willing, uh, it's currently our plan to roll out the new framework um, that will be um, supported and co-designed by both yourselves, industry and government. I'd also like to take this opportunity to point out Gerida in the room, wherever Gerida is. Can you stand up? Gerida's just there. Uh, Gerida is the principal project manager for the GITC review outcomes. Um, so if you need to contact uh, Gerida or you want to rush her after this, um, go and rush her. If you want to be involved in this particular project with us moving forward, I'm glad to have you on board. Um, but I think that's it for us. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark and Fahim. I'd like to um, invite uh, Mark and Fahim, as well as uh, Tim and Jensen, back on stage to, uh, to take some questions and answers. Um, and while they're setting up, our colleagues who are on, um, on streaming have got that detail, or if you wish to enter a question via text or uh, the uh, Go Digital portal, please, um, please send them. So. And perhaps um, so that our colleagues um, um, who are on streaming can actually get the questions, perhaps if you could wait until the microphone arrives for questions that uh, you want to make. Thank you. So, any questions? <laughs> Okay, well we have one, uh, one asked for us, and this is for Tim. Um, how are mobile apps developed, internal or external, or a combination, Tim? Yeah, at, at the moment uh, the work that we've done has been largely internal. We've done, uh, I guess we've gone to market and done some assessment of external existing apps that have been developed. Uh, example would be in a property inspection type uh, situation. One of the challenges is that uh, ultimately that needs to link back to our back-end environment, which as a legacy environment and legacy business practices um, doesn't align nicely to contemporary modern practices. Um, and so we've found so far that that presents a, a real challenge for us. Um, going forward, I would hope as we are able to change that back-end environment and bring that more uh, contemporary, then what we'll find is that the more uh, readily available uh, apps might be able to align closer with our back-end environment. But to date, uh, w that hasn't been the case and the development work has been done largely in-house. Um, I have got a team in total, my application development and support area is about 50 people, uh, and so I've got a team that are able to do that. Um, but going forward, that may not be the, uh, the case, and we'd certainly be interested to, to look at other options. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Hugh Peterkin from Business Analyst. Actually, my question's to Tim. Um, appreciate your presentation. I thought it was a very positive presentation around the IT environment. And just to contrast that with the Queensland Government audit run by Peter Grant about two or three years ago, have you got any commentary on where things have got to? Peter talked about a digital debt, which was a very substantial figure around um, out of date, out of support systems. Um, we didn't hear much about that in your area. Does that mean you've largely been able to resolve those issues since the audit? Uh, yeah, look, um, as I say, there was, uh, for my agency, um, 
Whilst uh, that transition through 2012 uh, was fairly painful, um, Housing and Public Works uh, went through a substantial uh, rationalisation uh, in terms of our environment. There were a number of legacy uh, business, commercialised business areas that government had uh, that the government of the day chose to shut down, things like the state stores and distribution services, the old SDS, um, the government printer. All of those commercialised business areas were running on legacy environments that uh, I guess for a long time had sat in the too hard basket about making investments. But so too that uh, housing back-end environment was certainly identified through the ICT audit as being one of those at-risk systems. Um, it was quite challenging. Uh, pretty much three years we were in a procurement phase and, and I have to say it was quite challenging to work through with government um, I guess to gain the confidence of government to be able to sign a contract which was at the time I think sort of one of the most major ventures that government was taking on on the back of what had transpired from 2010 with the health uh, payroll issues. So it was quite difficult and it did take us three years. Uh, we actually, you know, in a different environment, we could probably have got that done in about 18 months. Um, so it was quite challenging. Um, we believe that uh, as, along with that rationalisation work where we've, as I say, we reduced our landscape in, uh, application landscape environment from in excess of 4,000 apps to down to about 400. So that's not to say that we haven't still got some challenges there. Qfleet is a good example. If there's anybody in the room that can code in KCML, I'd like to talk to you. Um, and, and so there's that legacy environment that runs uh, the government's fleet environment still at the moment. Now, again, for quite a while there was uh, a question mark around the, the whole future business model for Qfleet. Um, we now know that they do have a future, and so government needs to um, work with us and address the, the concern of that um, in terms of a fleet management solution. So a, a sort of a perfect storm occurred in terms of uh, the capability, the desire, the will to clean up for us our environment, along with... Uh, the desire to modernise in our environment meant we were able to address a number of concerns along the way. But there's still some, some issues, uh, but most of those we believe we've got a plan and we're working through addressing those. Any further questions? I'm a little shy this morning. <laughs> Um, you uh, sorry, Darren Ryan from KJR. You, you, Tim and, and Jensen both spoke about going to the cloud. I'm just wondering what are some of the issues you see with um, going to the cloud for your uh, agencies? You go first. You go first. Um, probably our biggest challenge is, in, is currently under, under the model that we have in place is our authorising environment for a lot of this stuff. So we've got to basically get the commissioner level of the agencies comfortable. Um, now, ambulance and fire are pretty uh, bit more relaxed about it than, than police. If you, you can imagine, uh, QPS does have some sensitive information uh, in there and, and, and those systems may or may not go and in some cases the cloud environment's more secure than our own. Uh, there's some legislation issues that, that we've got as well. Um, even things, some of the sensitive type of information, I mean the obvious ones are the uh, crime and who's involved the names and numbers and all of that, but even the, the frontline officers, we've got covert police that we need to protect identities and so when we look at our, the systems and how they're all blended and how they would need to interface because everything's kind of is like a big bowl of spaghetti in there at the moment. Um, someone used the analogy kaplunk, but you know, you pull out the thing, all the marbles will go through. So we've got to be really careful of what we put out there. I think the obvious ones though for us to, to get moving on is the, is the more commodity based services first and, and, and begin the journey that way as opposed to taking the leap of faith into systems where there is a sensitivity around who's got access to the information. See, we're still educating that even within government now, the commissioner can send an email whilst we've got it on-prem. As soon as he sends it, it's likely to be in a cloud service um, through someone else in government as some of the other agencies are on cloud-based services. So they're starting to, to um, warm to the idea and certainly with the advice that 
I talked about mobility. They want to work everywhere. They want to be device agnostic. Um, that, that's going to force us to open up things uh, than what we've been able to in the past, which is really exciting for us. And it's, it's a direction, that, that direction we hadn't actually had up until recently. So. I guess for us, um, it's a little bit easier. I don't have the same sort of challenges in terms of data sensitivity uh, across my portfolio. Uh, we do have some small areas of that. My team's done um, some work over, I guess, this year. We've developed a fairly simple but very effective data classification tool. Um, I think that's sort of the biggest challenge and, and where you need to kick off in terms of understanding the sensitivity of the data that you're dealing with. Um, and so we've got a tool that we've, uh, I guess, piloted through our agency, done that assessment across about uh, 42 data sets and identified classification of that produces a, a nice report that you can top and tail with briefing notes to get moved through and get the appropriate approvals um, where you're looking to send some data uh, off premise so to speak. I think some of the other challenges will be for us, everyone in the room in terms of I guess that ever growing maturity around understanding exactly how the model is going to work for us all. Um, I think in the early days there was a lot of hype around what cloud could deliver um, and of course we've now learnt over a very short period of time some of the, uh, the key sensitive issues that you need to make sure you take into consideration. Moving out to cloud isn't necessarily going to end up in uh, a whole heap of savings for example. You need to be careful around um, how that work's going to be commissioned. You need to be careful about how it's going to be managed. You need to be thinking about at the back end of whatever arrangement you put in place, at some stage into the future, you may want to get your data back. And so how is that going to work and what does that look like? So I think it's a, a challenge for everyone in terms of as we mature in this space to understand um, how best to apply it, what situation suits it best. Um, I got no issues with putting um, data in Singapore. The issue is I have is if that creates a latency concern for my people on the front line in Thursday Island, then it doesn't work. Wherever it is in the world, I don't care. I, I'm, you know, we've got to make sure it's safe and secure and appropriate, but at the same time, it's got to be able to deliver in terms of the performance stuff. Um, it is a challenge for our business areas to get their head around um, what that might mean and for them to understand. Um, one of the interesting challenges uh, I know that I had faced with my previous Director General was to help them understand the concept of backup and the fact that we no longer have the file server in the corner and there's last night's tape backup and if we have to do a restore, we'll just restore from the tape. Um, it, uh, it has been particularly challenging to help them understand um, what is a very modern environment may in fact not involve a tape backup and uh, you know um, it could be very different the way that we're going to recover and, and it is a bit challenging I think um, for some of our business executives to sort of wrap their head around uh, what that might mean to their business. Thank you. We have time for just one more question. Okay, sounds like uh, coffee is calling. Um, Look, I would like to thank uh, Tim, Jensen, Mark and Fam for um, fantastic presentations this morning. Um, just a reminder there, you to join the discussions and provide your solutions on the innovation portal, which I believe we have the, the details there. And also to like us on the Digital Queensland Facebook and follow our Queensland Digital Twitter page. As you know, you'll get a uh, feedback form, which uh, we do value your input. We do like to look at that to help us guide and, and form our future PIT sessions, so we look forward to, your, to, to uh, receiving the feedback from that. Um, and also please contact the, um, the, the PIT team if you need any further information. Uh, as you probably realise, we had a little bit of a glitch this morning, so we're a little bit uh, late in starting, but uh, look, there's a fantastic team here, both at the edge and uh, my own team who have put this together. So it, it's a very professional presentation, so I'd like to join me in a special thanks to Steph, Nicole, Sky, Matthew and Sharon for putting this together. Thank you. So please all join us for networking and tea and coffee out in the foyer. Thank you.